And China's focus on development in general is certainly an opportunity uh, that China is bringing to many in the region. And we can discuss, and certainly I hope we will, uh, the benefits and disadvantages to that approach. Um, we can also debate this, but I think that China's attention to the region also calls greater U.S. attention to the region. And I think that's to the good. Um, when we talk about the pivot or the shift or whatever we want to call it, we're essentially saying that the U.S. is putting more attention on Asia. And I think that is a good thing. So I think that's an, an opportunity for us to uh, uh, refresh uh, uh, our uh, interaction with our allies in the region and others in the region. Um, and then one other, I guess this would be an opportunity, but it's more like an anti-threat, is that uh, in the past, in the 1970s and, and 60s in particular, China had uh, tried to uh, manifest its own type of regime change in Asia. It had supported, uh, in many countries throughout the region, Maoist or, or communist rebellions. Um, and that's certainly not what we see anymore. Uh, China is really willing to do business with nearly any type of regime, whether it be an autocracy, a democracy. Uh, you know, in Sudan, they were talking to Islamist states. I mean, it seems that China really has a, um, an approach uh, to the region and the world, which is uh, that they will deal with nearly anybody that's across the table. And that leads to a lot of uh, opportunities. Um, and we could say those are bad opportunities for those people we don't like, but there certainly are opportunities um, uh, that are available. But China also provides uh, a certain types of challenges to the region, and particularly to the U.S. in the region. Um, China's illiberal politics, I would cite as one important challenge that China presents, right? China is not a democracy. China does not have freedom of speech. China does not uh, uh, allow people to really seek redress through the court systems. And I believe that this is a, a challenge that the region faces in, 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 a, in the way it uh, uh, addresses uh, the rise of China generally in the region. Um, China is also uh, uh, projecting a more muscular military posture. So it's not just that China is illiberal, it's also that China is also gaining an increasingly muscular. Uh, a few weeks ago, they announced their uh, newest defense budget numbers, and uh, you, Randy, you know better than I, but I've got $144 billion, uh, up 10%. So that's, that's a significant investment in uh, military in the region. And I think, again, if I'm not mistaken here, that the U.S. spends $600 billion, but that's for the entire world. Um, so China is... I, I mean, I'm not sure if we can break it down, and maybe this is one question that you can think about is, percentage-wise, of that $600 billion the U.S. is spending, how much of that is in Asia? So if we look at how much China is spending, since nearly everything China spends is in Asia, um, how does that compare to what the U.S. spends in Asia? Because I think that number is going to probably be a bit closer. Um, but again, this is probably just the tip of the iceberg. We really don't know what the Chinese military is spending on its budget. So um, this is simply what they're, they're telling us. Um, but I think probably like the U.S. budget, the military, there's a lot that we don't know here. Um, and in addition to these Ill illiberal politics, in addition to this military spending, we also have a revisionist regime, a regime which is building uh, uh, islands or building up islands uh, in the, in South, e in the uh, South China Sea, uh, which is challenging the status quo in terms of the, uh, the South China Sea in particular, and the, uh, the East China Sea, and, and I think uh, Randy's going to talk a bit about that as well. So we have a, a illiberal, uh, increasingly muscular, and a revisionist regime that actively wishes to diminish the U.S. role in the region. Um, to the de it's, it's, I think, to some degree uncertain as to how much that role uh, should be diminished. I mean, I think in the more honest moments, Chinese friends uh, will admit that uh, the U.S. role actually had a constraining influence on Japan that they found quite helpful in their development. But how much uh, does China want to push the U.S. out of the region, I believe, is an open question. So I just wanted to tee up some of these questions, and certainly that's a, uh, a smorgasbord, but you can, uh, as you address uh, these issues, certainly address uh, uh, ones that I've left out, which are probably plenty. Now, part of the problem here is that it, this sheet is much shorter than this sheet, right? So Randy's background is so extensive that picking and choosing what to introduce is part of the problem, and I don't think I've ever had that problem before. Um, but there's one word that keeps coming up when you look at his bio, and that's the word service. That whether it be in a military capacity, a civilian capacity, or now in a private capacity, he is constantly serving. So I'm going to go through some of this service, uh, beginning with his academic credentials, because after all, we are in an academic institution. Uh, he holds a, a BA in history from Williams College 
and a, pub and a degree in public policy from Harvard University, which we will forgive you for not coming here to LBJ. Um, he uh, has served extensively in the military. Uh, he was an active uh, Navy intelligence officer for three years, from 1989 to 1991. Uh, he's a Desert Storm veteran. Um, he, after serving actively, he served in the Naval Reserves for nine additional years. Um, in that role, he was Special Assistant to the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He was an attache to the U.S. Embassy in Beijing and uh, to the U.S. Embassy in Ulaanbaatar. Uh, in terms of his civilian service, he served for four years in the Office of the Secretary of Defense as Senior Country Director uh, for China, Taiwan, and Mongolia um, from 97 to 98, if that's right. Yep. Um, he was uh, the senior official responsible for the day-to-day -day management of U.S. bilateral relations with the People's Liberation Army um, and uh, bilateral security and military relationships with Taiwan. Um, he also uh, served as assistant country director to the PRC, uh, Taiwan and Mongolia, in the two years preceding that. Um, he joined the State Department in March 2001 and worked for two years as the chief of staff and senior policy advisor to Deputy Secretary of State Richard Armitage. Um, after that, he moved on and served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia and the Pacific, responsible for nearly all of East Asia. Um, and he also had experience in Congress too, so also in the legislative branch. Um, he served uh, in the uh, Washington and District Offices of Representative Denny Smith of Oregon, where he hails from. Um, and then after leaving government, um, he has an equally distinguished uh, a record in the private sector. Uh, he's one of five founding partners of Armitage International, uh, one of uh, DC's more influential uh, uh, consulting outfits. Um, he's also CEO and president of Project 2049 Institute, which examines security trends in Asia. Um, and he's a senior associate at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. He serves on the board of the Center of the New, you're getting the drift here, right? <laughs> Um, it's, it, 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 is, it is amazing, and you have to find me your youth serum, too. Um, uh, it serves on the board at the Center of New American Security, the Board of Advisors of the U.S. Taiwan Business Council. He's also my good mentor, I mean my good friend and mentor, and uh, without further ado, uh, let's welcome him here to the LBJ School. Thank you. Josh, thanks very much. I appreciate it. And uh, thank you all for turning out. I look forward to this discussion. Um, I, I normally in, you know, thank my host for the invitation, but uh, the truth is I invited myself. Um, I was eager to get back to Austin, first visit here in, in uh, over 20 years, and uh, wanted the chance not only to interact with the folks in this community, but to see my, uh, my friends Josh and Will and Bowden in the back. Um, there's a saying in DC, if you want a friend, get a dog. You could either get a dog or you could get to know Josh and, and Will because they truly were good friends and colleagues of mine um, when I was there at the State Department when we first had a chance to meet and, and work together. So it really is uh, my pleasure having invited myself uh, to come to be here and, and to spend this time with you. Um, I appreciate the introduction. I think you, you laid out a lot of the areas I was going to touch upon. I did notice, now, now Josh picked the title of this talk, and, and I, I agreed to it, but as I, I opened it up uh, today and I was thinking about what I was going to say, it's opportunities and threats from China. Now, I served just long enough at State Department, four years, to get infused a little bit with that you know, diplomatic uh, posture and, and orientation, thinking, ooh, we usually say opportunities and challenges, not opportunities and threats. Um, but I thought I would take it head on uh, because when you say threat from the military and from the intelligence community, you're talking about a very specific thing, a very specific formula. Threat is the combination of capabilities and intent. That's how we talk about threat. Um, so I thought I would save opportunities so maybe we could end on a more positive note, but uh, talk about the threat, talk about the capabilities and the emerging intentions of China and, and address the behavior and the activities through that uh, prism of intentions. And I think starting with capabilities, the first place uh, I would start would be the military modernization and the impact that's having uh, on the region. Um, there are lots of different ways to describe it and, and ways you can approach it. You mentioned the budget figures. Uh, it's correct that the official budget that was just released does include another 
10% increase. In fact, that's been the norm for at least uh, well, 19, 18, 19 years. Since 1996 on, uh, the increases in the official defense budget have been double digit, all but one year. I think one year was eight or nine percent. So not only this year we're we talking about 10 percent increase, we're talking about a trend that's been going on for almost 20 years. If you understand uh, uh, what's what's the term in economics with uh, interest compounding interest <laughs> you, you get the you get the uh, notion that this is a priority area and it's actually outpacing uh, what most people believe to be the the economic growth although in many years it was double digit as well uh, but at this point is clearly outpacing economic growth if you believe the official figures seven eight percent growth so it's it's clearly a priority but that's not necessarily the best metric. You want to look at what they're actually investing in and how that's translating into capabilities. And I, I, could, I could give a couple other sort of anecdotes and, and examples of, of how this informs my view. In uh, about 2003 or 2004, we did something that governments are often loath to do. We decided we were going to grade ourselves. We, were, we decided we wanted to see how well we were doing in um, analyzing the Chinese military, their modernization efforts. And so we looked back on uh, uh, national intelligence estimates, on other intel products and, and briefings, and we, we wanted to, to measure how well we were doing. And what we found was, was pretty striking. Uh, at every juncture in, ver in, in virtually every category of description, we were underestimating the progress that China was making in their military modernization efforts. So they're investing a lot and they were getting better quicker than we thought at the time. And I would suggest that that trend has continued. Um, it's also important that you, you, you raise an interesting point about what the U.S. spends in the Pacific. I'd, I'd have to think if there's a way to calculate that accurately. Um, uh, but putting that aside, I think there, there is sometimes a temptation to say, what do we spend versus what do they spend? What platforms do we have versus what platforms are they developing? Um, to my mind, and I think most in the um, Intel community, that's not really the right metric either. Um, to be sure, the U.S. 600 billion plus a year in defense uh, is a larger, more capable, more effective military than the PLA in most categories. Um, but what we do want to better understand is in the range of known contingencies in which we could potentially be involved, and we can name several, um, does China have the capability to make our intervention more difficult, more costly, or perhaps even prevent us from intervening by raising the cost so much? Um, and that's an equation that is, that is in motion, I would suggest, that they are developing those kind of capabilities. You've probably heard the expression A2AD, anti-access area denial. Um, that's a phrase meant to describe the Chinese ability to hold at risk U.S. forward deployed forces because after all, we're, a, we're not a resident power, we're a distant power. Um, but, uh, we, and therefore, we rely on uh, forward deployed basing uh, primarily in Japan, Korea, uh, smaller military facilities elsewhere, as, we're, as well as our forward-deployed naval assets, uh, they now have a very good ability to hold that at risk through a, a variety of developments. Uh, primarily, the backbone of the PLA and, and a niche area of excellence is in the area of ballistic and cruise missiles. And when you think about it, it it's really changing the equation of, of power projection, regional power projection. The United States, our version of power projection is we take our platforms uh, in an expeditionary fashion, uh, that could be ships, could be planes, could be forward deployed forces, and, and we project power from those platforms. China is basically developing the ability through ballistic and cruise missiles to do everything from the homeland to affect regional security uh, out to pretty good distances, at least the near abroad, uh, but increasingly to greater distances. Now there are limitations if you only can bomb and destroy and, and, and uh, uh, target things with missiles. Um, there's a, it's sort of axiomatic that you need a soldier with a bayonet to bend an enemy to your will and to take and hold territory, but uh, certainly to impact security, affect security, and affect the U.S. decision making through ballistic and cruise missiles alone, um, they're developing that. And, and the numbers are, are pretty overwhelming. The buildup really uh, started at 95, 96, around the time of the Taiwan Strait crisis there. Um, I think opposite Taiwan, 
short range and ballistic missiles is in the neighborhood of 1,200, 1,300 missiles. Um, but the, uh, the inventory is, is bigger than that, and now there are um, uh, brigades that are targeting uh, Japan and, and other areas uh, in East Asia. Um, now, mind you, these missiles, at one point, the United States and the, the then Soviet Union decided that, that these systems were so destabilizing that we were actually going to outlaw them by treaty, right? I mean, that's basically what the INF Treaty did in 87. We said short-range, medium-range ballistic missiles are so stabilizing, the reaction times are too short, they're too lethal, to, they're becoming too lethal, too accurate, that in order to create a more stable environment, we were going to eliminate that whole class of weapon. This is the backbone of the Chinese military, the, the ballistic and cruise missiles, or I should say ballistic missiles, cruise missiles we have, they have. <coughs> um, so that's, that's something to bear in mind. Now the military modernization has absolutely been full spectrum across all services. Um, so you can count planes, you can count submarines, um, uh, army equipment. Um, they've got at least one aircraft carrier working on another. That's fine with me as a Navy guy. Investing in last century's technology is okay with me. Um, but I think it's got some in the region. It's got their attention. Um, carrier is certainly a, a statement of, of power. Uh, and, and status, um, but what they're really getting better at that is, I think, or should be of concern to us and our allies is what, what would be called the C4ISR infrastructure, um, because it's one thing to have the, the, the bullets, the shooters, it's another thing to have the uh, sensors to pick up target track and then relay that back to the shooters. And so the Chinese have invested quite heavily uh, satellite capabilities, um, UAVs, uh, there are plans for at least 11 coastal UAV bases, all for um, basically C4ISR to go out and monitor the maritime domain areas and report back uh, potentially to shooters if, if it were to come to that. So they've made a great deal of progress there um, and, and that I think is, is uh, indicative of, of what they want to be able to, to do in the region, what they want to hold at risk and so forth. So. Um, of course, we read a lot about cyber capabilities. Not all of that is, is military. A lot of that, in fact, is uh, dedicated to the theft of commercial IP and, and other information. Um, but certainly the cyber capability could be integrated into the military uh, doctrine, military domain as well. Um, so I think the long and short of it is in, in, in that part of the threat equation, capability and intent, the capability side is has grown uh, pretty remarkably in the last 20 years and they are at a point where they, they can at least raise the cost to us and our allies and, and certainly if you're talking about um, countries operating in the environment against China without the support of the U.S. or without the support of, of U.S. Uh, power, um, it, it would be overwhelming for most of those countries at this juncture. So. That's, in a way, the easy side of the equation. Capabilities are things you can generally see, touch, measure, understand. Um, the intent side of the equation might be a little more murky. Um, I think if, if I were giving this talk 15, 20 years ago, and, and certainly when I was at the Defense Department in the mid-90s, we would talk about capabilities being, you know, growing, getting better, but intent very unclear, and a great opportunity to shape their intentions uh, and, and bring them in as a uh, constructive partner in, in our regional activities and so forth. Uh, I, I think fewer and fewer people are saying that now, and I think there's a great deal of more evidence that suggests we know quite a bit about their intentions. Um, Josh mentioned Project 2049. We're a small think tank in D.C. Um, we have uh, native or fluent Chinese speakers on our staff, and we do a lot of uh, open source exploitation. We, we read Chinese military journals and, and websites and, and um, we have a, a very sophisticated formula for analyzing China and I'll share it with you. Um, we we uh, read what they write, we watch what they say, we listen to what they say, and we watch what they do. I know it's very sophisticated, um, but increasingly again I think it, it suggests that their intentions are quite clear. Let's start with the kinds of things they're saying. Um, they are increasingly articulating a security architecture for the region that's quite different than the one that we are articulating and that we're implementing. Um, if you 
saw e either the speech itself or the reporting on the speech when Xi Jinping spoke at the what's called the Sika conference he gave the speech which later was dubbed the Asia for Asians speech um, because in that speech he basically said the Asians are perfectly capable of taking care of their own affairs they don't need outsiders meddling the alliance structure that the US is leading is uh, a relic of the Cold War no longer appropriate for modern security challenges and so on and so forth um, that has been re-articulated on many occasions. Actually, you did a, a good job at another event I saw where you went through all the usages of Asia for Asians and all the different um, instances where it had been promoted. Um, now, it's aspirational, and, and the question that you put forward, are they prepared for a precipitous withdrawal of the United States or uh, a greatly diminished role of the United States? I would certainly question that. Um, I think they have benefited from the peace and stability that the U.S. forward deployed forces have provided and our alliances have provided. And I think a precipitous withdrawal could have some unintended consequences from the Chinese perspective. Japan may be remilitarizing in a, in a more robust way and, and, and other potential unintended consequences. But nonetheless, I think the vision is very clear and, and it's being articulated consistently. And it is absolutely at odds with what our administration is articulating, right? I mean, what is the, the, what is the, piv the pivot and the rebalance or rebalance? It's doubling down on alliances. It's increasing our presence. It's increasing our activity. Um, and you could debate on how effectively the pivot is being implemented, but you can see signs, you know, what we're doing in the U.S.-Japan alliance with the defense guidelines revision that are about to be announced at the end of the month. What we're doing in the Philippines with increased assistance and increased training and, and operations moving out of just the counterterrorism area and into the maritime domain area. Look at what we're doing with Vietnam. Um, you know, pretty hard to imagine that we would open the, the door to arms sales to Vietnam a few years ago, and now here we are. We've, we've made a, a policy exception to potential military arms sales to Vietnam for that specific mission of maritime domain awareness and maritime security cooperation. So we are going in opposite directions, at least in terms of vision and aspirations, and I think that's a serious thing. I mean, th this could play out uh, over an extended period of time as we, in our own ways, try to implement our respective visions. But I do think we are on, uh, on a course that puts us at odds, and that's not a small thing. Um, so that's kind of what they say and what they're talking about. Um, I think more to the point that speaks to intentions, or maybe not more to the point, in, in addition what speaks to intentions is their behavior and their activities. And I think in short, what we see is, is a more assertive China, uh, in some cases more aggressive China. Now, of course, there's another side to this. The Chinese will say, well, you know, we're, 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 we're more capable now. These, we're, we're looking at sovereignty claims we've always had, but we haven't had the capability to, you know, really exert our claims. Um, we're now behaving in a way more commensurate with our growing power and, and influence. Well, okay. Uh, but Nonetheless, it, it, it could still be true that this is causing great consternation among our allies who are claimants to the same uh, territories that China's claiming and, and certainly uh, uh, concern for us because we're not disinterested in these matters. In, in many of the cases, and I'll go through some of them, um, we have actual treaty obligations and other obligations that would come into play should there be uh, a dust up over some of these areas. So again, assertive, aggressive behavior, there are things you can measure see, count, and uh, I would point first to the activities in the East China Sea around the disputed ter territory, what the Japanese call the Senkaku Islands, what the Chinese call the Diaoyu Islands. Um, if, you, uh, if you ever have an opportunity to interact with both Chinese friends and Japanese friends, you'll get two entirely different versions of uh, who started what and how this all happened. <coughs> and uh, to really try to get to the bottom of it, you have to go all the way back to 1895 and did the Japanese assert their claim in January 1895 or April 8, 1895? Because it really matters. Because was it part of the Treaty of Shimonseki or not? But I'll spare you the, 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 the full long version. But the more recent uh, tensions uh, emerged 2009-2010 time frame. The Japanese would say a noticeable increase in maritime activity from the Chinese uh, naval and maritime forces around the islands. 
uh, starting in 2009. The Chinese would say, no, the Japanese are the ones who really started it by nationalizing the Senkaku Islands. The central government purchased those islands in the summer of 2010. Um, no matter which side of that debate you come down on, um, the, the point is that China is, for the first time, really trying to exert their claim. They're doing it through naval and maritime activities, maritime being Coast Guard and uh, other um, uh, official vessels, <coughs> and, and flights. So the, uh, the Chinese um, Air Force is flying uh, in the airspace of these disputed islands increasingly, which then calls for the Japanese to respond with their own intercepts respond with their own naval forces. So this is a very dangerous environment. Um, the Japanese and the Chinese have no uh, protocols for rules of the road or s to ensure safety on the high seas. They have no crisis communication, to really a ability to speak of. Uh, and even worse than that, the, uh, the two leaders don't get along very well. So you can imagine in the event of a crisis how, how well they'd be able to do talking with one another and trying to work something out or, or probably more likely the bureaucracies. Um, and to re return to a previous point, we're not disinterested here. The United States has said on many occasions that our treaty applies to the Senkaku Islands. Uh, President Obama himself articulated that in April last year when he visited Japan. Um, it's a bit of an awkward policy position in a way because we actually don't take a position on the sovereignty of those islands. Um, when in 72, when we completed the reversion of Okinawa and the Ryukyu Island chain, at the very last minute, we said, okay, we're going to complete this reversion process and we're going to turn everything over to Japan, except on the Senkaku Islands, we're going to withhold our recognition of sovereignty, but we are going to turn it over to you to administer that island. And that was the key. And, and, we, and we did that because not so much the Chinese were making a claim, but the ROC, Taiwan, was making a claim on the Diaoyu Islands. So we decided not to take a position on sovereignty, but by transitioning the island to Japanese administration, our treaty actually says we will help Japan defend the sovereign territories of Japan and those areas administered by the government of Japan. So the Bush administration, the Obama administration, to include President Obama himself, has said yes. If there, were dust, if there was a dust up, a crisis, military confrontation over the Senkakus, our treaty does oblige us to help defend Japan if asked to do so. Um, so that's, a, that's certainly an area of concern, and I think it shows intent that China is um, uh, asserting those claims in a more aggressive way. Uh, a great deal of activity in the South China Sea as well, where there's at least six claimants, some of whom are allies uh, and some of whom we have obligations to, allies being countries like Philippines, obligations being uh, countries like Taiwan, ROC Taiwan. Um, and that activity is a range of diplomatic activity and military activity. So on the diplomatic front, um, China has uh, reasserted its claim of the, what, what people call the nine-dash line. Uh, is that a term that's familiar to people in the room? Um, if there were a map behind me, which there's not, you would see the South China Sea and a dash line that looks like a big tongue going down from China all the way into the South China Sea. And the Chinese say that's all ours. All the islands, all the, the water, the ocean in that is ours. And that's actually a legacy claim. It comes from the ROC government uh, who controlled China up until the Civil War and, and the period of 47 and 49. But nonetheless, they claim it. Um, the, uh, the problem with that is, is uh, there, from, by our definition and by the definition of international law, there's a great deal of international water there. A lot of commerce flows through there. And there are other countries that are involved with their own sovereignty claims of some of the islands. Um, in some cases, the Chinese have seized territory that was disputed, most notably, um, well, if you go back far enough, the aptly named Mischief Reef in the uh, 90s um, was seized from the Philippines, but uh, more recently in the last two years, I'm drawing a, what, was, what, what did they seize from the Philippines? I'm now drawing a blank. Uh, pardon me? Scarborough Shoal, Scarborough yes. Um, and we basically did nothing in response to that at the time. Uh, but the other thing there that's really interesting that they're doing are these island land reclamation projects. And it's kind of fun because you can actually watch this. If you go, I think one of the best sites is uh, an organization that Josh mentioned I'm affiliated with, CSIS, the Center for Strategic and International Studies, has something called the Maritime Transparency Initiative. And you can go and look at commercial satellite pictures of, of these building projects. So they're taking some of the smaller islands 
and actually making them bigger islands. And I can only guess what the purpose is. Um, they seem to be pretty well sized for an airstrip. Um, there's not much living on, on many of these places, so I, I doubt they're putting up malls or movie theaters. Um, Admiral Harry Harris, who is our commander of Pacific Fleet, said that they are putting up a great wall of sand with these land reclamation projects, which is kind of an interesting term. Um, but certainly that's, that's, that's a provocative move, uh, an aggressive move, considering that there are other claimants to these areas. Um, and pretty much no response from the U.S. or others, uh, other than the indirect response of helping our, our allies and others with their capacity in the maritime domain awareness area. Um, so those kind of assertive and aggressive activities, I think, speak to intent, that kind of behavior. Um, we see a different kind of diplomacy as well, and having served at State Department, I consider that an instrument of national power as well, your, your diplomacy, your diplomats. Um, assertive in, in the existing uh, regional organizations like the ASEAN Regional Forum. They were uh, very key in blocking an effort to pass a code of conduct, a, a robust code of conduct. They ended up with something more diluted, um, which would have simply said uh, freedom of navigation, freedom of the international water space, uh, peaceful resolution of disputes, so forth. Um, uh, they were instrumental in blocking that. But the other really interesting thing is what Josh mentioned, the creation of new institutions and new modalities for conducting diplomacy or development assistance. And uh, the one that's been in the news recently is this AIIB, Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank. Um, I, I want to be a little careful how I talk about this because I, I actually disagreed with the efforts that the Obama administration made to prevent our allies from joining it, but I don't want to sort of sound partisan in that. I, I understand why they did it. Um, the Chinese are potentially creating a competitive organization to the existing institutions such as the Asia Development Bank, the World Bank, and so forth. This is an entity that may not live up to the same standards and norms and, and have the same kind of transparency. Um, so I, I sort of understand their unease with it. Um, on the other hand, when faced with similar situations in the Bush administration, we actually encouraged our allies to get involved in, in Chinese initiatives because we thought we'd be better off if Australia was at the table, if Japan was at the table. You remember the East Asia Summit, I'm sure, very well. And uh, we, didn't, we weren't invited because we weren't an East Asia nation. We decided initially not to be an observer. We later changed that. Um, but we very much encouraged Australia, India, Japan, South Korea to involve themselves because we wanted them. If we had concerns about transparency, if we had concerns about norms, we wanted those countries at the table uh, helping formulate those. <clears throat> but nonetheless, I, I, again, just back to the, the point, it does speak to some intention. They're, 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 they clearly find something inadequate about the existing structure. Surely they could have upped their contribution to the Asia Development Bank, or they, you know, they could have done something in the existing infrastructure. They didn't want to do that. They're creating something new that they'll be the largest contributor to and, and therefore will have the largest say over. Um, it complements some of their other initiatives, uh, such as the Silk Road Initiative and the Maritime Silk Road Initiative, which are also development assistance projects, one in Central Asia and one that goes through the um, maritime areas of Southeast Asia. Uh, you know, I think, again, that this, if you want to talk about status quo or revisionist power, this is clearly trying to change the norms and the rules of the game. And I agree with Josh, we can look at this as, as perhaps um, a challenge or opportunity. But I think it should at least get our attention, and, and, and it did get our attention, but I think we responded maybe not in the, in the smartest way. Um, so, to sort of pull this all together, you know, I think we are seeing very clear signs of their intentions, which are to, over time, uh, change the security architecture, see a much more diminished role of the United States, to see a, a, an effective end of our alliance system over time, um, and, and basically um, have more latitude, more range for maneuver without the potential for the U.S. to be a, a, um, uh, a block to that or, or to complicate that in any way. <clears throat> so that's what I think they're doing on the capability side and the intent side. Um, most of what I described 
would be a challenge or a threat to U.S. interests, but not necessarily the U.S. itself. Um, they are developing more advanced uh, nuclear weapons and their delivery systems. But the one where they're really affecting us in the here and now is in the cyber domain. And um, I, I, don't know how to, I don't know how to adequately describe how bad it is. Um, but it is a very robust effort. I think thanks to our friend Mr. Snowden and, and through other um, leaks and stories, an impression has been created that we're all doing it, we're all equally guilty, we're all bad. Well, we're all doing something. We're all involved in, in the cyber domain um, for intelligence purposes. Uh, but I don't know that I can persuade you, uh, but, but I can just tell you I am very uh, confident in the knowledge that our activities are very much in the area of traditional intelligence activities, meaning our targets are our governments, foreign militaries, former for, foreign intelligence services, and the like. Their targets are U.S. businesses, U.S. companies, U.S. law firms. I mean, they will steal anything. They will steal information from a law firm. If they can get a little bit of advance warning on an upcoming merger and acquisition, they'll, they'll bet on it. They'll put money on it. Uh, if they get some IP from, from a company, they'll give it to a Chinese state-owned enterprise. I mean, it is absolutely rampant. So there's a qualitative difference between what we're involved in and what they're involved in. Now, you may think it's a, a difference without a great, a distinction without a great difference. I, I think it is uh, qualitatively different and it's something that we should work with our allies uh, to try to change that behavior on the part of the Chinese because it is very corrosive. Uh, in DC, I don't know about here, but in DC it's very corrosive. You don't know anybody who hasn't been hacked or had something, some intrusion or some problem. Um, and, and it really, that whole issue of trust in this relationship, I don't see how we get beyond where we are unless there's a change in, in this particular area. Um, now, I did say I would try to get into some of the, the opportunities. Um, you know, I'm still, I'm still an optimist in a lot of ways. Um, I think first and foremost, our, our trade relationship continues to be mutually beneficial despite a lot of the problems we have. Uh, it's a huge trade relationship. And, um, it could get on a better path. We're talking about a bilateral investment treaty. It's possible that that could be concluded or at least moved along uh, by the time Xi Jinping visits the United States in the fall. Uh, that would be a very good thing. Um, we have competing right now, I, I, I wouldn't say competing, that's the wrong word, side-by-side -side trade liberalization efforts in Asia. The United States is involved in TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Agreement. The Chinese have RCEP, which is regional something, anyway, a Chinese-led trade liberalization effort called RCEP, a U.S.-led trade liberalization effort called TPP. Uh, one of the encouraging things is that the U.S. has said, uh, I think from the start, but maybe not in a full-throated, very clear way, but now increasingly in a clear way, um, we want China involved in trade liberalization ultimately. Uh, TPP is open to them. They have to meet the standards. It's a high quality agreement with very high standards. Uh, but ultimately, we don't have a problem with RCEP either. And in fact, what uh, President Bush first said and now President Obama is saying, we'd like to see an Asia Pacific wide uh, trade liberalization effort. So in a way, you could sort of imagine the merging or the integration of TPP and RCEP. That would be a great thing for, from my perspective. The important thing from a U.S. perspective is getting TPP done. I think the whole uh, pivot or rebalance, uh, if you got everything else wrong and got TPP, you'd probably get a B, B minus. If you got everything else right and didn't get TPP, I'd give us a, a C minus, maybe a D. Um, trade and commerce is the lifeblood of Asia, and this is, this is a real metric about whether we're in or out and whether we're serious or not. If we don't get TPP and the Chinese continue with their efforts, um, we're going to continue down a path where we are the security guarantor, we provide the public good of peace and stability, and the Chinese sweep in and get all the trade deals and economic benefits. That's not a good future as far as I'm concerned, but uh, TPP will be a, a big uh, point in, in determining whether or not we're on that path or, or a better one. So that whole area of trade and economics certainly uh, continues to be an area where there's more opportunities. Uh, I do think in diplomacy and in development assistance there are opportunities. Theoretically, development assistance should raise all boats, right? So if the Chinese are contributing somewhere, we're contributing in a different area. 
that could be all for uh, all for the good. Um, and in fact, the Asia, the, the interesting thing about the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank is um, we don't actually do much infrastructure development in our development assistance for a lot of good reasons. Um, historically, infrastructure projects are where the most is where you would find the most corruption, building dams, roads, bridges. You tend to to work with foreign governments in, in a more direct way and historically we've had a lot of problems with corruption in infrastructure projects but the fact is we're not doing it and are there infrastructure needs in Asia absolutely yes so this could be more cooperative and less competitive and I'm I'm disappointed we got off onto the wrong foot on this and I, I hope we can see it more in that light as, as we go forward probably would have to wait into a next administration whether that's Democrat or Republican I think there's plenty of opportunities in, in what we used to refer to as global issues, uh, health, you know, international um, uh, health issues, global pandemic, um, uh, environment, and certainly the Obama administration has worked on this with China. And when Obama, President Obama visited in November of, of 2014, one of the four deliverables he announced was a new agreement on climate change. Um, certainly as the world's two largest economies, the world's largest consumers of energy, the world's largest emitters, certainly there's work we can do on, the, on, on those issues. And in fact, it's essential. Uh, you just can't get anything done if you don't have the two uh, largest contributors to the problem. Um, international crime, so that, these are all in those areas that, that we refer to as global issues. And in the Bush administration, we created something called the Global Issues Forum between the United States and China. I don't know if it still exists. Do you know, Will? Uh, All those things got jettisoned. In not, not invented by us when the, when the new administration came in. Yeah, I've seen that before. Yeah, well, I, I, I'm sure we did the same with the Clinton administration. It's, it's pretty typical of most administrations to say that we didn't invent this. We're going to do away with it and come up with something else. Um, but that whole area, I think there is some promise there and, and certainly some shared interests, if not shared aversions between the U.S. and China. Um, peacekeeping, interna uh, humanitarian interna international um, interventions, uh, those areas have been growing in, in, our, in terms of our cooperation. Chinese are pretty active in international peacekeeping, mostly under the U.N. banner. Um, increasingly want to participate in humanitarian assistance. Um, to a point, I think that should be encouraged. Certainly, uh, at, at the time of a crisis and there's people in need, you don't really care who's delivering the goods as long as, as the food and the tents and whatever it may be you need are, is arriving. Of course, there is some overlap with the military there, so we'd want to be mindful of that, that we're not engaging in cooperation that ultimately helps their military modernization. But I, I do think that's an area where we could do more. We're doing uh, counter piracy off the coast of Somalia, off the, co off the Horn of Africa. Uh, and the Chinese officially are not in the coalition, in the operating coalition. Um, neither are the Japanese, which is kind of funny. They both had to be there because they were, the, the other was there. But because of the Japanese constitutional constraints, because of the Chinese uh, uh, political constraints of not wanting to be in our coalition. But to the untrained eye, it looks an awful lot like we're, we're operating with the Chinese and the Japanese. Um, those are probably good things to do. Um, there are other interesting areas. Counterterrorism is an area where there's a great deal of focus right now. The Chinese do have a real terrorist threat and, and they are experiencing uh, violence. But it's, it's a little tricky and, and we've been down this path before too. In 2001, we, uh, or late 2001, early 2002, um, we designated a group in Xinjiang called ETEM, the East Turkmenistan. Independence movement as a terrorist organization. I, I, to this day, would still say we are right to do that. We we went through the um, very rigorous process of review on the organization, the violent acts that they'd committed, their political aims, and so forth. But it turns out that for the central authorities in Beijing, any Uyghur in Xinjiang who wants to exercise their religious freedom, speak their mind about potential greater autonomy, or maybe even independence looks like a terrorist and looks like Etim. Uh, so there was, we had difficulty when they blended political activities and what we would regard as peaceful activities as terrorist activities. Uh, nonetheless, their concerns are growing because their threat is growing 
And they also increasingly see that this is not a problem just within their borders, that there are links between extremist groups in China and the familiar suspects in uh, South Asia, Asia and the Middle East. And so there is potential for greater cooperation to deal with the global terrorist threat. Um, so, you know, I, I think what we're likely to see is, is a continual muddling through. We have created such a bureaucratic infrastructure for exercising this relationship, implementing this relationship. All of our great bureaucracies have counterpart meetings at the cabinet level and sub-cabinet level. We have very routine summit meetings. Um, uh, a, a behemoth called the Strategic Economic Dialogue, or now it's the Strategic and Economic Dialogue, usually involves seven or eight cabinet secretaries going to China or hosting their counterparts in Washington. Um, that's once a year. So a great deal of activity, um, which in a way is a, is a stabilizing force in the relationship. When you have summit meetings, you generally try not to have uh, too many problems on your doorstep con confronting the leaders when they meet. Um, we might have enough of the positive opportunities to kind of insulate us from, from the uh, potential challenges and threats. Um, and and we, we can also be somewhat comforted by our history. We've certainly had ups and downs and rocky periods in the relationship before. And every administration, Republican or Democrat, has found a way to, to manage things and prevent conflict and, and serious uh, confrontation with China. We've come close, EP3 and Taiwan Strait crisis in 96. So we've done it before. We should be confident that we can manage these differences and, and tensions in the past. Problem is, of course, that as China grows more capable, um, you know, they can assert themselves in ways that are more difficult for us to manage. And if they really are on this alternate course in terms of their vision for regional architecture, that's, that's a pretty serious thing if we don't arrest that and, and bring us into a more consensus view. Um, I haven't even talked about one of my favorite topics, Taiwan. It's been uh, pretty quiet for seven years when the KMT has been in power, but uh, the DPP, the opposition party in Taiwan, is leading the polls, and a lot can happen between now and January, but if the election were held today, Dr. Tsai Ing-wen would win, and the DPP would come back to power. And of course, the DPP and their party platform still has independence in their party platform, and uh, still is, is seen with a lot of suspicion on the part of Beijing. So some old problems could reemerge in unhelpful ways. Um, so I think it's a pretty complex picture. Um, and it's, it's something that's certainly going to occupy the rest of my professional life. I, I feel good that I'll probably be gainfully employed uh, <laughs> just because I have the, the, the China background. And, and maybe even my four kids will be working on this. Uh, in fact, they probably will. This is probably the the challenge of our generation of our lifetime and, and probably as far as the eye can see for now. So why don't I pause there and invite questions or comments. So I, so I was thinking I would take uh, maybe two or three.